that day, for no particular reason, I decided to look for UFOs. So, I looked up at the end of the road for a UFO. When I didn't see one, I thought maybe I'd run to the end of town. When I got to town and I didn't see a UFO, I thought maybe I'll just run across the bridge. And I figured, since I hadn't seen a UFO yet, maybe I'll just run across this great state of Texas. And that's what I did. I ran clear across Texas. And for no particular reason, I kept on looking. I ran all the way to the river. And when I got there, I figured, since I look this far, I might as well turn around and keep on looking. When I got to another river, I figured, since I looked this far, I might as well turn back and just keep on running after the truth. When I was sleepy, I slept. When I was hungry, I ate. When I had to go, you know, I went. Anyways, like I was saying, I never did end up seeing a UFO. My mama always says you got to put the truth behind you before you can move on. And I think that's what my looking was all about. I had run for five years, four months, three days, and 16 hours. I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. Welcome, Dean. Dean, it's nice to talk to you today. Is, is Tommy going to make it? Uh, Tommy, unfortunately, uh, couldn't make it. Oh, interesting. Well, I was definitely hoping that Tommy could, could come and talk to us today because um, he was one of the abductees. And some conspiracy theorists online are suggesting that he was actually abducted and is not an actor. So it certainly would have been nice to talk to him today, but um, we'll we'll talk to you just just you. That's just fine, Dean. So let's see. Let's so get, let's get into it. Um, so like many, um, I found. You know, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm late. Hey, how have you been? I, I, I'm like stalling. I'm trying. I was. Know, this is my reputation. They think it's, it's fake. Well, here's the deal. It's it, coming in from a different world. It's not. Well, coming in from Hollywood, which is like a different world, and the traffic was bad coming through the, the <gasps> path. I, mean, I don't Actors. know. So hey, I'm a person too. Excited to bring a very special episode of the Weird UFO Show to you, interviewing director producer Dean Aliotto and actor Tommy Diavocini. I hope I didn't brutalize your name. I've seen it a lot. Uh, wow! <laughs> I've said better it than I do. Okay, better great. than I do. Dean directed and Tommy starred in what perhaps is arguably the first found footage film ever well before Blair Witch Project, well, well before Cloverfield, a film that I had found on YouTube, like some. This film was so realistic that some, including myself, even suggested it could be real, actual, found footage. However, it's not a film you can go get on Netflix today or in Hulu today. So for those who didn't get a chance to see this, uh, maybe we could just start with you, Dean. I do believe this was your first film credit. Sure. When the mothership came down to kidnap me, um, it all, no, you don't know about that story yet. Um, I don't want to tell that one. That, that's too personal. Um, I, uh, the idea came about because basically I was 24 years old. I had to make my first feature because all of my heroes, filmmaking heroes, had done that from Spielberg to Orson Welles. The challenge was I had no money. And so I had a, a buddy of mine who had 6,500 bucks to his name and wanted to buy his way into the movie industry as a producer. And 6,500 bucks at the time apparently was the going rate. We, uh, I, I was thinking, well, you know, what can I do with 6,500 bucks? 
And around that time, I read the book Communion by Willie Struber, and it sufficiently scared the hell out of me because it was purporting to be real. Um, I mean, I've been a fan of, of UFOs off and on as, 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 a, as a kid and found it really, really interesting and felt like, okay, this, this could maybe work. Um, so as I was flying, I was, I was living in the Bay Area at the time, which is where Tommy and I met. And I remember looking out the window, we were flying at night, and thinking, what if this was the last time I was going to see Earth? What if I was being abducted? What would that be like? And I started thinking, how could I tell that in the most realistic, raw way without it, you know, trying to compete with Spielberg and, and the budgets he has? So I came back and, and hit on the idea of what if I actually do make a, a home video to, to match the budget, except something really interesting happens like they get abducted by extraterrestrials. And so with that in mind, I thought, all right, I want to avoid all the, the Hollywood tropes um, and cliches and, and let's... Let's start with not even a script. Let's have an outline that has story beats in it and, and essentially take it from there and, uh, and shoot this you know, story of a family up in the hills uh, celebrating a girl's five-year-old birthday party. And um, there's a blackout and they go out to investigate and, and then uh, one by one they get abducted. So um, I'm going to lead right up to this gentleman and when we started <clears throat> casting, so it was important to hire improvisational actors. And so instead of having them come, come in with prepared material, I had them come in and just tell me a story. And uh, that, that would hopefully relate to what we were doing. So Tommy came in and had Joey Tognari, the, the other uh, executive producer, and myself, on the floor laughing. Tommy brought some real uh, range to it. and Because uh, at the end of the day, this is all about family. And so anyway, I will let Tommy take it from there, how, how you came on board to play the older brother, Eric. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and for me, I was, um, you know, having an early midlife crisis, becoming an actor. I'd been doing improv for a couple of years and uh, started a little bit later. And I saw this, I saw an audition notice for this film and it said, come in with a story. So I came in with a story about being abducted. I think my favorite part of the whole audition was when I was done, Dean, who was laughing, Joey, had eyes the size of saucers, and he just, he goes, dude, when did that happen? <laughs> and I said, it didn't. I made that up. And he just goes, you're going to feel all these rooms. That's better. <laughs> um, and so what happened was this, you know, amazing experience for me. It was the first film that I had done. The fact that Dean trusted us enough, <clears throat> you know, to do a, a, you know, an improvisational piece this long. And, you know, there's, there's nothing like being in the moment when you don't have a script and you've got to rely on the other performers to, you know, to move the story along. Because it wasn't scripted, because Dean allowed us uh, the latitude to, uh, to play off each other. And, um, you know, it was a short shoot. I think it was, what, uh, one night. One night. One and a half. Wow. Uh, yeah, one take. One take. Oh, my God. I think that's why people think it's real footage, because nothing seems scripted. And yet nothing seems fake at all. People are talking over each other. It feels like you are really there, you know, for those who have not seen it. And it's so realistic. You, f you feel as though you are in this house. Um, it, you're really just along for the ride from the beginning of this girl's party to the eventual intrusion of these very ominous e ETs, and it's, it, which makes it all the more interesting that you had this small budget and this short shooting schedule so you found Tommy you found this great talent because um, the whole cast I mean there's not a, a weak link while there appears to be not a weak performance by the cast there was one cast member unfortunately who was a little bit didn't bring his a game and that would have been Michael who played the cameraman and um, <laughs> he, <coughs> he we well he's dead now he's dead now Oh, yeah. And, um, At least in my heart. He's dead in my heart. Is he? Because he knew something. He knew something. And then he was uh, replaced by somebody else, I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, let's just suppose that I played that character uh -huh. very, very well, better. You're a replacement, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the challenge was that I had to operate the camera. I had a headset on. And I had to be a character in it. And so I had to cue my first A.D. Craig Patterson and say... 
you know, uh, cue the light in the sky, cue the aliens. Mm -hmm. And so I'm operating the camera, I'm trying to be this character, cover all the action, improvise with these guys. That's why it was important that, that there was a team around me that kind of carried it that I could just ride on the way that they had created. Um, Tommy is, uh, if I can divulge this, um, Tommy told me while we were making this, I hope this is, I'm more oh, go, go right ahead, okay. find out what it is. All no, right, so Tommy <laughs> said, dude, I grew up with not a lot of conflict. My parents didn't fight. And uh, Warden and, June Cleaver, basically yeah. Warden June Cleaver, it's crazy. Yeah, and so um, he said, I'm not really sure, I don't have a lot of experience with conflict and everything, there's a lot of that dynamic in here. And I don't remember what I said to help you through that, or if I made it worse, all I know is that when we got into the conflict, Tommy threw down and was like, you know, telling them, shut up, his wife, shut up. Um, this is what's going to happen. This is it. And threw down hard and uh, brought it. And there was this like electricity maybe because of it, because um, it was this, this thing that was maybe, I don't know, bottled up or whatever. But I remember going, I just trying to make sure I captured it all because it was all gold. So um, Tommy's also my good luck charm. I've had him in a lot of films, and uh, he's just a joy to work with. So if there's anything, that, that was there. 30 years of repressed anger and <laughs> angst from growing up in that understanding. How can you people? I know you're my mom and dad, but you don't argue. Step it down. So what about the special effects? So there, there's a, a there's a ship um, off in the distance, and then we actually see the gray, sort of your classic gray alien characters in this film as well. So how, how did those come, come to be? Because our budget was so low, we literally only had $750 for the ship and aliens. <laughs> Luckily, I knew this great up-and-coming production designer, Bill Bowes, who went on to work for Tim Burton and uh, did the first Fantastic Four movie. Um, great guy. He came in and literally assembled a ship in, in front of me. Um, I helped out as best I could. He started with like this, this kind of foundation, this triangle of, of just uh, two by fours going up about maybe nine or 10 feet high. And then he built these um, sheet wood platforms going, you know, like this, then one smaller and one smaller. And then he got foam core. I don't know if you know what foam core is, but it's like um, cardboard, but um, uh, it's a little bit stiffer. And so he starts cutting them into triangles and he's having me do this. And I'm like, what are we doing? And he's like, trust me. And I'm going, this is going to look like crap. But I don't have time. Let's just do this. So he's giving a staple gun and he's stapling them in between each of the layers. And as he's doing this and fitting the, the triangles that, that we've cut on the foam court all around it, it starts to take shape. And I'm watching this thing and I'm going, oh my God, this guy's a genius. And so we finish it. And then he did the alien faces and, and their hands. And at first they couldn't see, and so they were bumping into each other. <laughs> and, uh, and my ex-wife, uh, Trish Marino, was taxed with having to corral them. So when I cued her, they had to walk out first one, then another one from another area, and then one from behind. And, um, uh, yeah, we nailed it. Somehow, miraculously, nailed it on the first take. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the credit for the ship and the aliens all goes to, to Bill Bowes. So, so why was it um, so hard for people to track down, down this video? I know that people, um, even my stepdad says he recalls seeing clips from your film on TV as news, as news footage, and there's just these memories that people have of it being real. What happened was, um, essentially, after uh, we made the film, which would have been 88 or 89, 89 right? It actually got distributed, but the distribution company a month later burned to the ground. And so I lost my main master and all my artwork, and I thought, well, that's it, time to move on. And then um, five years later, I got a call from this guy saying, hey, do you know who found this footage? Your name keeps coming up. And this is the first time that I think the, the term found footage, or at least I had ever heard it. And I said, well, no one made it. You know, <clears throat> we made it. And he said, you know what's been going on with this video for the past five years? I said, dude, who are you? What is, what is this about? And he says, someone, a few mom and pop video stores, before Blockbuster, I guess, got some copies, advanced screeners of the movie, and they edited off, off the credits and passed it around one guy here. Uh, 
I'm assuming a guy, it could be a woman. Yeah, that was very sexist of me, I'm sorry. <laughs> a person, a person, could have been an alien, could have been an alien. <clears throat> that sounds even Female more possible. Alien. In, injected it into the um, UFO community where it ended up at the International UFO Congress Convention uh, oh, in wow, 1990. Uh -huh. And brought the house down, and a lieutenant colonel um, claimed it was authentic as well as a UFO researcher. It just built from there, and so I went on this Fox show. Uh, encounters and they did a special on it and then that led a couple years later to me um, partnering up with um, uh, Paul Chidlick where he and I wrote um, the film and produced it together and I directed it. Um, Paul actually um, wrote the script we ended up having to create a whole new script because it was time and it was co only coming in at an hour and so um, I had to write a whole new outline and then split where he wrote that half, I wrote the other half, and I did the Tommy confessional stuff. And, and then that became a big thing that, that actually engineered, at, this is for UPN television, the first TV movie, became Alien Abduction, Incident Lake County, also known as uh, the McPherson Take. And then that became the huge big conspiracy that, that this is, that I was taking claim for directing the first one, which was supposedly real. And that I was hired by the government, and I guess UPN as well, um, to create a, another version of it to throw everyone off. And so, um, anyway, um, that's kind of, so at that point, I got a little freaked out. I had been invited to, to, to speak at conventions before, and I was always afraid because of all the, the conspiracy theories. Did you get harassed? I don't know, Tommy, if, if you yeah, do I got as some, well? Uh, or? I got some emails about what was my agenda, and so I kind of just looked project die and kind of let it go away. And then over the years, um, <coughs> there's been a few up and coming filmmakers who have reached out to me and who have started to, to do well. And they said, you know, you need to get this out there. Um, this was fun. This was part of my childhood. I enjoyed it. And so um, for the 25th anniversary, I just got back from going back to the International UFO Congress Convention, where I screened a, um, a new digitally remastered version with the behind the scenes. And um, uh, we, we had a blast, and it was fun, but there were still people in the audience who believe that it's real and that I work for the government. That's why uh, I never changed, huh? There. Because if Tommy had been there, um, that kind of dispels everything. In fact, this is the most concrete evidence you're going to get that the original mm -hmm. is... You shouldn't be is, here, right? You should not be here today. You shouldn't be here. You or should yeah, I should have some spaceship. stories about... You know, where I've been and what's been going on or on the alien ship. Yeah, on the alien ship. Or at least I should have like a big chunk of time that's missing somewhere. Yeah. Um, he could be CGI. I could be talking Exactly. To well, is that what people Stip tell you? I mean, do people... So do you get that, Tommy? I mean, do people like literally accuse you of being like a, a cologne or... Um, well, there's an interesting story Tommy told the one with the Japanese. That the Japanese reached out to us and they said, "Hey, we want to interview you." And I'm like, "Great!" And they said, "We also want to interview Tommy and and Laura Tomas, right, who played the girl." And uh, so I'll let you tell that. <clears throat> well, it turns out they didn't really want to interview me. Um, they wanted to like do this kind of wrap up of the film where I'm back, and this is the lake where my family was lost and it was just kind of weird and I'm calling Dean I'm going what do I do and he goes look you're already committed to it so and I have no idea what ever happened to that footage yeah they wanted Eric they didn't want Tommy no. they wanted his character they, they wanted Eric. Eric because they're thinking it's real um uh, uh. And so then they're going you know well where is this lake you know by your house and I'm going well first of all we were in the Santa Cruz mountains and we're right now in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles so if you wanted to actually go back up to there, it's about a six hour, six and a half hour drive on a good day. Um, and so then it's like, can you find us a lake? <laughs> yeah, let me do that. You know, I got, I'm going to find you a lake in the San Fernando Valley, and I happen to know one. So we went there and uh, they basically shot me going, yes, that's, that's where my house was. And it's the last time I saw my family. <laughs> I didn't even know this, by the way. You called me after and said, yeah. that was the weirdest thing. And I go, well, my interview was fine. Well, what happened? And he goes, they wanted me to be Eric, and I had to make this whole thing. I'm like, what, holy shit, my first thought was, that's hysterical. 
Well, with Check out my story. I, I want to see you for abduction too. Yeah, yeah. It makes a little extra money on the side. Being, I got my Eric suit in the car in case you need <laughs> bar mitzvahs. They got bar mitzvahs. I mean, you bar could. Mitzvahs. I mean, people are so fascinated with the story. I mean, as am I. Which you know sort of makes you wonder. I mean, with all the from your perspective and everything that you guys have, have been through this strange experience, you probably didn't expect. Are you a little jaded about stories of actual UFO evidence out there? Um, yeah. What it, well, I, first of all, I feel guilty that, that I was kind of part of that. It wasn't, wasn't the intention at all. It was just, you know, how do I compete with Spielberg in a way that, that is completely different, that ended up becoming, um, you know, a, a, one of the first found footage movies, <clears throat> but just to let you know how how the thinking is, when I tried to sell my film to Fox, uh, the, the remake as a TV movie, I was told that people lose careers over this. And then a year later, they ended up making Alien Autopsy. Now the guy who interviewed me was, was the producer of my segment that I did um, on the Fox show Encounters, was the same producer of Alien Autopsy. And so at that point, left a bad taste in my mouth, and now I'll see people mm -hmm. putting stuff up online. And you'll see that, that because of CGI effects, like if I were to do alien abduction again today, I could do it for probably 2,500, and, um, and have the ship land because it's so cheap to do all these effects and everything. So I look at them, and I'll sometimes troll, and I'll say, take a look at the movement of the ship. <clears throat> it's different from the frame rate of the shots. So um, it is getting harder and harder, and the ufologists, and I talked about that at the convention because their task is, uh, is now twice as hard. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to perpetuate that anymore, but I still want you to feel like you're watching a real experience of an alien right. abduction without being abducted. Yeah. What about you, Tommy? I mean, how do you feel? Is there any UFO evidence out there that's compelled you, or are you just going <clears throat> to be skeptical about most of it? Yeah. You know, not not to be giving you know product placement or endorsement. I am a huge fan of ancient aliens. I simply have this. I got a belief, which is, you know, that the universe is infinite, and you know, I mean, if and if there is a God, conscious higher power thing out there, I mean, if we're the best they could come up with, you know, I could maybe see why they might stop and go, no more, no more. So, I'm convinced that there's there's other intelligent life out there. I wouldn't be surprised if there have been encounters over historical time. I think it's probably, I think it may be a smaller community um, than it makes itself known. Because uh, I also think that some of the people who truly had the encounters are so moved and altered by it that they probably don't know how to talk to anybody else. I do have a friend, a uh, dear friend of mine, Ben, uh, whose dad was in the CIA and told him that there are no true conspiracies unless there's only one person. Because if there's a conspiracy, somebody somewhere along the line is going to, you know, spill the beans. Um, but when I do see some of the information about Roswell and about some of the other stuff, it does seem like there has been some disinformation. And like Dean said, you know, I don't want to, I want to be part of something that would give people the feeling of what that might be like, because I think it is a possibility. And I don't want to be thought of as somebody who's like trying to be, you know, if anything, I don't want to be the person going, oh, you did this thing to make fun of those people, because I, especially if that's been their, their, their truth, you know, what a heavy burden to be carrying. So, um, you know, mine was to give them an entertaining experience of what it would be like to show them. Um, and if I did a good job of that, I, I'm really happy. But it wasn't to, to you know, put anybody down or to, to make fun of anybody or to disinformationize. That's not a word. That would be a word. I, I don't think that there will be a disclosure because I'm still, um, I still have not heard a reason, a motivation for the government to come out and say yes. Um, at the convention I spoke and I was saying, motivation. if you go like this, if you say, you know, to a, to a kid, you say, hey, you know, what is that? And the, and the kid goes, well, I'm, I'm, I've got this. I'm, you know, it's hiding this from you. The first thing we're going to ask is, what else is behind there? What else are you hiding? So I, I just don't, 
don't see that being advantageous. I mean, there's enough time that's gone by that you can say, look, those are several regimes ago. Um, but, you know, you've got Russia, you've got China, you have all these power nations that would want to see all the material and should be entitled to the material because it came to this planet. There's no ownership really on it. There shouldn't be. Um, the way that Roswell was handled, something definitely landed there. Yeah. And, and I'm a big, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for Tom DeLong who, who helped engineer the footage that was released from Pentagon mm -hmm. that shows um, the, uh, the fighters coming up and tracking the, uh, the obvious, you know, UFO. It's banking, it's turning, you can see all the coordinates, how fast yeah. it's moving. That, and the New York Times covering it, and uh, I think her name was Leslie Keenan, who, who, who covered that story, that was a, a milestone that people mm -hmm. kind of forgot after a few weeks. Yeah. Um, but when it becomes normal, when you look at, you know, before the Northern Lights, if I described them to you, you'd say, yeah, green streaks in the sky, okay. And then you go there, now we can quantify it. When that happens with, with UFOs and, and visitations, then it'll become, you know, the norm. But so, I mean, I know, Dean, you just were at the UFO Congress. Um, you guys have both stayed working in TV. We already talked about the uh, incident at Lake County film, but have done, you know, lots of work since then. So what's in your future? What were you up to at the, the UFO Congress this year? Uh, at the Congress, I was just kind of um, finally telling the story. Now it can be told, giving anecdotal, um, you know, insight in, into how the two stories, the two movies, came about. Also screening the film for the 25th anniversary. Fun. You can actually pick up a new version of the film oh, for the first time ever at uh, ufoabductionmovie.com, okay. and um, I put the behind the scenes there from the, the Fox show there on it as well, so people can finally see it and. And again, it's a digitally remastered version of the film. And uh, so I was kind of launching that, as well as I have a new uh, film venture called Alien Content. And you can go to aliencontent.com, and it'll link you to it. And what it is is, is uh, over the years, I've realized that a third of everything I've written has been alien and UFO related. And so I, I formed a production company to just do alien and UFO um, projects. It's kind of, so the, the reason why is that it's been like every 10 years that we get a really, really solid um, UFO film. If you look back, you go 2001, then you go Close Encounters, then you can go E.T. Um, uh, Fire on the Sky was pretty good contact. Was I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Arrival. Well, that's a long dis, you know, chunk of time in between, distance. And so the idea is to be doing, um, doing them on the regular. And that would include documentaries, but it would be some fun, thought-provoking, entertaining movies and TV shows. And you know, for me, I don't know, I don't know what the universe has in store for me next. I've been doing, uh, you know, I've continued to do some work in some improv and some small um, live acting. If I knew what the universe had in store for me, I would be living in a huge house <laughs> up of Mulholland, looking out over Malibu, laughing at my little friends. Down in the middle. Um, <clears throat> And that's the beautiful, and that's the scary and the wonderful thing about life, is we don't know. I have no idea <clears throat> what even the rest of this day is going to look like. I mean, I have done a lot of Wednesdays, and I have done a lot of uh, February 21sts, but I have never done like 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday the 21st, 2018. So I have no idea what's out there. I would love to be, uh, it's kind of deep, I know. Um, don't you have an anal probe? Yeah, I've got the anal probe coming up. <clears throat> That's just in a couple hours. Everybody over 50 should be getting an anal probe. <laughs> they, they're now with Bluetooth, they just they put it in, they send out the, the dish comes out like with Cartman <laughs> in um, the South Park. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm, you know, I'm continuing to uh, to act and. Uh, Please do. Please I, do. I love that, and um, you know, I, I have no idea other than to. Um, more acting. But, you know, to try to be of love, to be of service, and uh, to continue doing what we're doing, that, uh, you know, if we can bring joy to some people um, in a time when people are really having some difficulties, I think that's an important thing as, as artists.
anyways, like I was saying, UFOs come in all shapes and sizes. There's disc shapes, diamond shapes, bell shapes, pie shapes, wheel shapes, star shapes. There's uh, teardrop shapes, Foo Fighters, big triangles, small triangles, deep fried, stir fried, pineapple UFOs, hat shaped UFOs, double hat shaped UFOs, flying humanoids. There's conical UFOs, half moon UFOs, boomerang UFOs, UFOs and potatoes. Cigar UFOs, UFO sandwich, that, that's about it.